Honestly, I don't know how all this started. I stumbled upon an ongoing mystery. Um, a lot of people might know it as Penny Roll. Uh, following the first, the release of the first season of the show Hellier. And I believe that first season they were real interested in goblins in Kentucky. And I had a story about goblins that I wanted to tell the uh, people involved with that. And um, I think I might have sent like an email or a message or something to Greg Newkirk of the Hellier crew, the ones doing the investigation into that, and, uh, you know, he's busy and 100% understandable. I probably bugged him to death about it, but, uh, you know, I thought it was interesting enough to at least be known to somebody. And then they come across, or right after I watched the first season, the second season comes out, and episode eight, they're in Somerset, Kentucky, which is just, like, bonkers, you know, like, like all this weird paranormal stuff and all this strange investigation leads them to my hometown. And I'm kind of freaked out about it. Um, I don't I don't really know, you know, what led them to Somerset in the beginning. But, however, there was this person on there uh, that they interviewed from Somerset and his name was Nathan. And it just so happened that Nathan hung out at uh, uh, Jarfly. And I was going in there one night um, to meet two other people to talk about my goblin story. And I seen Nathan standing at the bar. So I approached him and I was like, hey, dude, you know, I had this strange, you know, encounter with these goblins in this cave out in Shopville, Kentucky, you know, a few years ago and when I was younger. And it just all connected and intertwined together in like a really strange way and he's like oh shit man like that's you know interesting why don't you come up I'm actually doing an investigation myself it's called Penny Roll and it's gonna be like you know uh, eight series eight part podcast or whatever and I'd like to interview and hear it so I go upstairs and I tell him about what happened and he records me and you know I just kind of get tangled up in this whole investigation of something that I really have not, I've never actually had an interest in in my life. I barely believe in ghosts, however, I think I have encountered some, uh, let alone like goblins, like fairy tale stuff, you know, inside these caves. And uh, so I become involved with this, you know, investigation into the P Penny Royal Plateau and like all this strange shit going on, right? And really get tied into it. And then, I think, maybe, like, three months after it was released, I got in contact. Well, I didn't get in contact. I was contacted by um, a guy. I can't disclose his name because he doesn't want me to. Or his partners, for that matter. But, we'll just call him Mr... We'll just call them Mr. and Mrs. King. And so, they traveled a very far distance uh, to come to my studio. And I interviewed them. And he, you know, after all this stuff and having an outside view from a different perspective. And let me just say, you know, disclaimers. I've only been subject to one religion in my life. And that's Christianity. And... They claim to be Buddhist, uh, you know, practice Buddhism. I don't know much about that religion. Um, you know, um, like everybody else, I've heard of it. And I know that they are very spiritual and things. But that's about as far as it goes to me. And so my first encounter with someone that practices this faith uh, was here in Somerset. And... I was subject to strange shit <laughs> that went on. I'm not really sure how to put it. Um, I've never seen a Bigfoot in my life, but 
we went out to the Daniel Boone National Forest and did a ritual to call in the Bigfoots and you know the atmosphere was weird I started feeling strange things um, just just some weird stuff and and like you know things intertwined with nature that you know I've, I've seen my whole life or connected with my whole life that I never really seen from that different perspective so yeah anyways this is I guess the only way to say this is this is this is the mystery summed up in a perspective outside of what I think we're all seeing it and it's strange uh, it's been it's been weird I'm not going to really disclose much more information of what went on but I definitely think that if you're interested in this or investigating this that it's at least worth your time to listen to what these people have to say I mean you know we're just a bunch of hillbillies and looking into something that we don't exactly understand and you know if there is higher powers or you know energies within the world that we don't particularly know how to use or manipulate um, it's probably time we start paying attention to those things before we get ourselves and the people around us into a lot of trouble so yeah Somerset has one of the most amazing energies I've ever seen. It, it definitely, like, definitely you can feel the crystalline vibes here like nowhere else. It kind of reminds me of everything that they say that uh, the Christian heaven is like. <laughs> Very blissy, a lot of white energy, a lot of white cloud. Oh, yeah. The, the locals are going to oh. love hearing you say that. <laughs> <laughs> I bet. Well, I can see why. Well, there's so many churches here. It, um it's very easy to tap into that just gentle peaceful divine energy yeah there's a lot more churches than there is anything else that and dollar stores <laughs> <laughs> a lot of chicken shops so um i wanted to talk i'm going to say some stuff that i'm i'm not allowed to prove <laughs> so i'm going to have to establish my credentials and um, I'm going to do that by showing some information that's a, that's a no-brainer. That's a duh. You know, that everyone's probably going to think, why didn't I, I just realize that? And I'm also not going to be able to tell you how I know this information. But I'm hoping to establish my credentials right away. Works for me. And what I'm going to do is share with the world the secret of the Sphinx in ancient Egypt. Everybody thinks it's the head of a man, the body of a lion, I forget what the rest is. But that's actually not the case. That's not what it is at all. And uh, archaeologists can't figure it out. And I believe that by putting this out there, people are going to just know that I have a little bit of information that is just not readily available to most people. So what is the Sphinx? The Sphinx is not the man is not a head of a man and body of a lion. It actually is. Let's see if this comes up. It actually is an old temple of Anubis. Oh. See, here's an Anubis statue. Yeah. The the tradition of the time is when a pharaoh came into being into power, he would replace all the statues with his head. It's Anubis makes sense right it definitely does right it, it it's exact <laughs> that's what it is <laughs> it's not a great mystery it's just a you know if they looked at the the habit of dynastic kings taking over the temples and just kind of mixed and matched which which egyptian god it was it's it's not this great mystery <laughs> yeah see i've heard people saying that originally it was just the the body and the head of a lion 
and that the lion's head was eroded so bad that one of the pharaohs had it redone with his head. No. Look, I mean, look at this. Oh, look, yeah. no, it makes perfect sense. Perfect sense, yeah. right? I mean, why didn't archaeologists kind yeah. of say, that's probably what it is? I don't know. I think it's just because people want to look at the supernatural or mysteries and add more to it than there really is. Well, that's kind of the case a lot, isn't it? Yeah. And, um, <clears throat> you know, you've had some adventures with us this weekend. Yeah. And... Adventures, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's been crazy. It's been, it's been fun. In, in the most... The, the best way. It's, it's yeah. been uh, very fun. See, one thing that people don't get is that paranormal might be the wrong word to describe a lot of the... Um, mystical and psychic abilities of humans and other beings. One phrase, or a couple of phrases that we've come up with over the weekend <laughs> is that it's not paranormal, it's super normal. It's not supernatural, it's super natural. So the very first step at understanding all of these wondrous things is to actually accept reality and yourself as it really is without any elaboration without adding on or taking away i mean uh, a tree has to do that so why shouldn't humans and all of these other supposed mystical beings um that's just that's just what they do and it helps that they live in nature you know yeah <laughs> so it's true i think the natural world anyways has a stronger connection yeah. to us than anything mm -hmm. you know yeah. whether humans. even even like like uh, heavenly energy, like I believe the natural world has a stronger connection to humans than heavenly energy does. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So, I'm going to take you all on a on a wild ride. This is going to be a fun talk, and uh, it's going to start off in 18th century Mongolia, and we're going to discuss a man by the name of Danzan Rabja. It, he was born in 1803. He died in 1856. One of the most incredible men as far as achievement I've ever heard of. He, uh, I forget how many temples he established, but it was over a hundred. I don't know how many stupas he put up, but it was a couple of dozen. Now, in, in, in his world, putting up a stupa is a super hard thing and takes a tremendous amount of time. He also established he also put up 30 epic national operas in Mongolia and these the, what was special about these operas is that the the theater was in three levels at the top middle and bottom and he would put on these plays these epic operas that were actually tantric what's called tantric theater very many people have this idea of what the word tantra means they automatically assume it's some kind of sex thing which is completely <laughs> completely <laughs> wrong tantra is a process so if you applied that process to anything it could be tantric laundry tantric golf tantric mothering tantric cooking it's it, it's just a process that's applied to anything and that process is first you have to go through a period of purification of mind body spirit and also your karma or in the christian terms your judgment you know the weight of your actions have to be measured or made to zero well that's a lifelong process <laughs> it is a if lifelong you're lucky <laughs> if you can do it <laughs> <laughs> But it's a worthwhile it's a worthwhile endeavor. Now, his plays would show the three realms that all beings exist in simultaneously. The heavenly realms, all actions we do reverberate throughout the heavenly realms, every single one of them. The earthly realm, everything we do in some way affects this realm. And then the lower realms. Everything we do affects the lower realms. So he would show plays of people living their lives and how their actions would affect those different realms. And that's going to be important later because of the hellier mystery. 
and this Somerset mystery. There's a lot of this type of theater happening powerfully here in Somerset. Now, what's also interesting about Danzam Raja is that he established Oh yeah, you showed me a picture of this. He established the earthly opening for Shambhala. Now Shambhala is a world that exists within the earthly realm. Just kind of in, it's in the mix. Where is it? Well, there it is. <laughs> now, in order to describe what Shambhala is, we have to talk about the three basic archetypes of beings who see, what's, you know, the supernatural world, the paranormal world. And those three, those three archetypes are the child, the mystic, and the madman. In order, to, in order to safely see the supernatural, you have to let reality be as it is. That's why the mystic and the child can see the other forces of the universe without elaboration. The madman is open to the greater reality, but fills in with his own mind, with his own personal references, what he or she can't understand. Hence, in the you know in the aim in the uh, Hellier mystery, Amy is spouting a bunch of Harry Potter conspiracy theory. You know, um, what's that guy? What's that broadcaster's name? Um, who's really popular? I don't know who you mean. He's on Joe Rogan all the time. What's his name? Oh gosh. Oh. Uh, um. Oh. Uh. I wish you wouldn't have said that because then <laughs> I would have told you. Uh, <laughs> I know who you're talking about. Yeah. Oh. Um. <laughs> What is his name? Alex. Alex Jones. Alex Jones, yeah. yes. <laughs> so everything she was saying was like a mix of Harry Potter and Alex Jones, right? It definitely was. She saw something. She definitely saw something. But she definitely falls under the madman archetype. Right. She was in the hell realm. Yeah. 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 She was seeing something. Now... We can go back a little bit, and let's start talking, you know, I mean, I, I really thank you for letting me uh, come here and explore my hellier, my hellier OCD. I was just glad we could help. Yeah, it's been fun, man, and, you know, and between you and I, we, we definitely cracked a few things. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> epic, epic. But, um, you know, in the very first email that they got from David Christie, uh, the email mentions Terry Wrist. And then they never find him. You know, it's in 2012. And then um, later we find out Terry Wrist is a hacker. Now, I don't know why anybody ever thought of that. Because in 2013, they ended up going down to, was it North Carolina? And um, going into some caves or whatever. And then when they come back, Terry Wrist knows what happens. Now, either that man is psychic, you know, or he hacked their computer. Yeah. You know, which one... I mean, one takes more energy than the other. Yeah. Being psychic takes a tremendous amount of time, training, and patience. Hacking, you can... Oh. It takes I mean, some you people. You have to learn it. Yeah, you have to learn it. But... That would be a, a, a type of energy, you know, dealt towards something, yeah. I guess. But I, I think being a psychic would definitely take a lot more power and energy and time spent to master, just be able to, you know read their thoughts and know what they're doing next. Being right. a hacker seems a whole lot more likely. Yeah. It, in today's society, yeah, pretty much. I yeah, mean, no. I mean, in order to, um, you know, be that psychic and that right on about somebody, you have to know them. So, you know, um, which I get into later. Now, in 2017, at the end of episode one, the end of our season one, or a whole throughout season one, they're going to caves in Hellier, Kentucky, and they're sending intention all through, like, they're sending intention to get in touch with them. They, to whatever beings are throughout the entire mammoth cave system, you know, they're sending out these strong psychic intentions to get in touch with them. And, uh, you know, a couple weeks later, months later, Amy, out of the blue, I mean, before even season one even comes out, 
or before anything, she gets in touch with them. We'll, we'll touch on that in a bit. Um, they asked for contact in the mines, and contact something did. Uh, you know, the, the psychic requests of the Hellier team in, in Kentucky, or in Hellier, Kentucky, probably went up the chain of command from one entity to another. And then, you know, the main source of energy in the Mammoth Cave system in, you know, this area is Somerset because of the large quartz deposits and the unbelievable magnetics that are here. So if you were an um, all-powerful being, you'd have your minions throughout the entire cave system mm -hmm. and you would be centrally located in the highest magnetic area. Mm -hmm. uh, so in 2018, that's when Amy sent that email and Tyler goes down to that other location. Uh, North Carolina or something where you had that strange encounter with the uh, uh, the helicopter and um, and the whole of uh, the SWAT team or whatever everything it was I mean that's a strange thing but I thought might also just be that there's a strange man in town but what they didn't mention in the movie uh, or season two of Hellier is that what Amy said in her initial emails to the Hellier crew she knew intimate details about Tyler Strand's childhood. You know, she knew things like some crazy woman knew that, things. That is uh, weird. That is weird, right? Yeah. Now, what kind of being could know something about Tyler Strand? How would that actually happen? Well, the higher up you go in say they are hierarchy hierarchy of spiritual beings the more skilled they are they do have some abilities that to us seem unnatural or just impossible but to them that's just how they communicate let's just say uh, a type of deity or a type of uh, being I don't I don't really want to say the name of this class of beings you know um, They have the ability to implant thoughts in other people, and they have the ability to just see someone's whole life. So, Amy, okay, first off, traveling around in Somerset here, for the most part, Somerset is just this amazing, amazing, blissful town. I mean, you drive around Somerset, and you're just getting relaxed. You drive uh, over on the east side of Somerset, between Somerset and Daniel Boone, it's one of the most relaxing things you could ever do. I don't know of a more divine place on earth. I mean, it's so peaceful. It's a good way to spend a Sunday evening. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> j just driving around and, and seeing the countryside, I, I that's better than any massage I've ever gotten. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's one of the most amazing places. And then all of a sudden, you come to Hale Bridge Road. You know, I mean, it's straight out of a movie. As soon as you turn onto Hale Bridge Road, all the trees start looking gnarled. They're in weird shapes. There's more shadows than there are anywhere else. There's more rot. There's more things in disarray. All of a sudden, now if you think about that three realms of existence, here is sort of a place in Somerset that has sort of an underworld energy all by itself, you know? In, you know, in 2017 and 2018, they call, you know, um, Greg, Dana, uh, who are, uh, Carl and Connor, they're in the caves, and they call out in a group to some being to come in contact with them. And then my theory is that some being in Somerset heard them and con and worked through Amy and did what it could to draw them here why else would they you know this mad woman who doesn't know anything all of a sudden I mean she really is a mad woman and and not to put her down I know she's going through hard times but she did see something she really did see something um let me just go through this okay We'll get to what she saw. 
What was the point of that? What is the point of these beings reaching out to Terry, uh, to uh, Dana and Greg, Carl and Connor? What is the point? What does this being want? Beings like that always want one thing. They want worship. Worship helps them to grow. Worship helps them to stabilize. It gives them a sort of life force. It's kind of like food to them. Yeah. Now the power center, Somerset, would definitely want to draw in all the best of the opportunities. Now, let's get back to Terry Rist. Terry Rist is a, a gentleman who's been involved in all kinds of esoteric things. I know he's involved with the OTO and to some degree. You know, I'm involved in, in a few traditions, and I've, I've been introduced to a lot of elder monks, nuns, priests, and priestesses uh, in, in, you know, since I was 20. is when I got involved with these things, and uh, I've worked really hard. And I've seen this relationship before. Uh, you know, there is some elder person with knowledge, and he, they meet someone who's younger, and they, and they want to, you know, throw them a few chances. They throw them a few bones. See if they're going to gnaw on it, you know? See what they can do. And that really, really leads to what I think about Terry Rist. He knows Greg and Dana. He's shook hands with them. He's connected with them in some way. Do you think it's Alan Greenfield? No. No? No. He doesn't look like he's wasted his time, and he doesn't look devious. N well, Nathan and Kyle and Darian have been talking about it a lot, thinking that maybe, you know, this is for a big scheme of him before he goes, you know. Well, I, I don't, I, you know, I know that um, supposedly he's resurfaced again. I know that supposedly Greg had lunch with him a couple of months ago he says he may or may not i mean i i'm not in his inner loop i don't i'm not on his patreon forums or anything so i don't know the inside story i can only see what i do but right i don't think he i don't think it's greenfield greenfield he doesn't look like somebody who's calculating you know i mean you've been in the military you you pretty much have to like size someone up right away yeah yeah you know does he look like somebody who'd waste his time no so what does he what's what does Terry Rist really want? He is a upper I mean he's been doing it for forty years, whatever it is he's doing. And, you know, he provided he provided a long con. <laughs> That's exactly what he did. What was he after? I think he was after Dana. I think he wants Dana to become something in his order. Now how would an older guy get a young woman full of promise to do what he wants? Well, what we know of Terry Riss so far is that he likes to play games. He likes to lead people on chases. And he wanted them basically to do the blue star ritual. So, okay, that, that we, I think a lot of people can agree that's really what he wanted. what he wanted. If he had asked Dana to do that, she would have never done it. She's, like, when you, everything you can see about her, she's clearly got a head on her shoulders. She looks like she's yeah. solid. Dana seems like a really sensible person, and I think that the only way that he would be able to lead her into another oh. tradition is if she decided she wanted to do it. And what would make her decide to do that? Her husband. So he created this elaborate ritual or game to basically draw Dana in. Dana wouldn't do anything. Dana wouldn't go down to Hellier by herself. Right. No. Greg would have to be all excited about it. You know, I mean, <laughs> if somebody wanted your wife to do something like that, right? I would definitely have to be in on it. Yeah, you would have to be the... convincing. Yeah, you yeah. would have to be the one, right? So yeah. he, he fed him crumbs like there was no tomorrow. Things, you know, didn't peter out. Yeah, you know, in 2013, like a few emails and then he disappears maybe he just he saw that Greg wasn't going to get into it well then a couple of years later all of a sudden these synchronicities started happening he started getting drawn in or a whole bunch of people started getting drawn into this goblin story 
How did that happen? Well, once again, Terry Rist, in my theory, knows them. He shook hands with them. He's probably spent time with them. And he's also adept in a tradition that... Um, oh, I didn't... I, I forgot to mention. What is Tantra? <laughs> Let's get back to that, because I'm, I'm, I'm about to make a really good point, and I totally messed it up. What is Tantra? <laughs> All right. It's okay, we get sidetracked. Yeah, we get sidetracked. We get sidetracked here. What is Tantra? Tantra is a three-part process. One, you go through a long period of purification. Uh, body, mind, spirit, and, and energy, and, and, all, and karma. And then we got sidetracked on karma. That's the first step. Two, you identify with a divine being, whether it be Jesus Christ, Buddha, uh, any of the Hindu gods, any of the Taoist gods, any of the Native American gods. So you visualize yourself as that being. Or any of the negative gods, you know. That happens too. That happens too. And then the third step, it happens when it happens. You cannot make it, you cannot fake it. Is that you experience the reality the exact same way that the divine being experiences reality. So that your name, when you refer to yourself, the I that is you, that I becomes the same self as the divine being. That whole process, whether it's a positive, say, Tantra, or a negative Tantra, is Tantra. That's why you could be like Shiva playing golf. You could be, you know, Jesus doing the laundry. That is what Tantra is. It's, you know, people got caught up in this whole sex thing about Tantra, and, they're, and they're just, they missed the boat entirely. Hmm. Now, Terry Rist, I know, I, I have a pretty good idea of what being he's channeling. Alright, that's his deal. But he went through the same process. And he's able to channel the energy of that being. That being would also want worship. It would also want people of caliber to be brought into the order. So, Terry Rist was channeling the energy of that being and sending it towards Greg and Dana. That kind of thing of sending the energy of a greater being towards people would cause synchronicities galore. Reality around them would start to vibrate at the will of the being sending the energy. I've seen this a lot, a lot. People think that they're onto something when they're just being enchanted by forces that have ego. You know, it, I have seen people in the thrall of it who all day, every day, they think something great is happening and their life force is being dwindled. I think, you know, Terry Riss wants Dana in and to do a blue star ritual. Well, through my own detective work, I have some friends in the OTO and um, who have left and uh, I won't give up their names and there's a lot of information in the OTO that the inside is clearly not sharing with Greg and Dana and I, I had thought long and hard about whether or not to give that information to Greg and Dana and I ultimately had to turn it down somebody gave me all of this information and um, I decided after long, long talks with Miss Kang here, <laughs> to not hand over what I believe would be ultimately detrimental to uh, everyone if it went public. And, um, I mean, it's secret information inside the OTO. I don't think I should be handing out their information. There'll be a time and a place for anything declassified. Well, I'm not going to be the one bringing it out. I don't want the wrath of those beings. Roger that. But Especially when we're not involved with it in the yeah, first place. Yeah, we're not. You know, it's like finding sacred Christian texts, and I'm, and I'm not Christian. You know, I have no right spreading that around. So, but one information I did get from inside the OTO is what the Blue Star ritual really is. Well, it's gone. You know, at this point, it's really public as to that it's a um, it's a sex magic ritual, right? 
But from what I've learned from my friends inside the OTO, it's a ritual to turn a female into an oracle. You mentioned that to me the yeah. last time we spoke on the phone. Yeah. Now, so since the Blue Star ritual is specifically designed to, to, to uh, turn a woman into a kind of a psychic oracle... So where's Terry going to get a woman yeah. to go through with this ritual? <laughs> yeah, where's Terry going to get a ritual? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, he, he, it, it's... If a guy wanted a young woman as in, you know, uh, to go through some kind of sex magic ritual... Especially the impression that I get of who he probably is and what he's like, it might well, not be the easiest thing. Well, yeah. you, well, you also mentioned to me that you would want somebody with like a higher state of power and her being such an empowered you know witch yes. right she's she's one of the most popular witches on the planet yeah you know she if she she had any day she can command a hundred other witches to do a to do a spell she clearly has some psychic power and some training yeah and she, her, in her own right right and she seems like a powerhouse like and mm -hmm. she seems like someone who is grounded and generally compa genuinely compassionate and cares about people. You which know? is a good thing. Which is a very yes. good thing. <laughs> right, right. But you can tell that... You wouldn't want somebody that doesn't care about people. Yeah, we yeah. don't want Salem happening again. <laughs> right. No. But you can tell just by looking at her that she commands a lot of power. If I was an elder warlock, which I'm not... I would want someone like that in my retinue. So. Now. Back to the three realms. Oh, God, I keep on getting sidetracked. I keep on getting sidetracked. So, about this Shambhala. <laughs> There's so much I want to talk. I'm so excited. About the Shambhala. There are... Shambhala is a uh, is a realm. It's an entire realm of existence that is right next to the earthly realm. And what Danza and Rabja did is he slept with almost 6,000 women in his life. He's also capable of shooting a shotgun from hundreds of miles away at someone and hitting them and curing them. What? Yep. Wow. <laughs> He, uh, what are some of the other things he could do? Um, I forget. You know, there's a lot of things he could do. But what is interesting is the reason he slept with 6,000 women is because if you took their measurements from shoulder to shoulder and added up 6,000 of these women, it would be the exact perimeter of this area here, of this open, of these, of this thing right here. This uh, structure that you see on the picture right here. The energy of that coordinated with divine beings allowed for one of the entrances to Shambhala to be placed right there. Now, if you were a devotee of this tradition, you go to Shambhala bring it up on the picture and in, in or you go to the uh, Shambhala entrance in Mongolia there's a couple uh, in the other places of the world and it's a very uh, wonderful epic journey for anyone to take you there are a lot of guided tours and I would recommend it if anybody does and you come to these two um, boobs <laughs> <laughs> okay and depending on your level of development if you're just a regular person who's going and wants to start to get involved with the energy and teachings of Shambhala, you go there, you pour milk on the boobs, and you see what happens. And most people report a lot of healing energy comes their way. If you're of a, high, a little bit more development, if you spend some more time training, you go there, you pour milk on the boobs, and then you can see the entire realm of Shambhala. You can see it. And if you're of even highest level, if you've dedicated great effort and great 
training, you pour the milk on the boobs and you can walk into it. Now that's interesting because it points out that beings and humans, or greater beings and humans, can work together to create supposedly fantastical realms. Something similar like that is happening here in Somerset. And I want to try to help people understand the basic levels of understanding the three realms. You know? Have you ever been walking down the street and felt like you were walking under the earth? Yeah, like... I know what you mean. Like somehow your feet are touching your feet, but you're walking under the ground? Yeah. The, I, at times it feels like that. It's like a... I don't really know how to explain it other than that. Mm-hmm. Have you ever felt like... Um, like you're just walking down anywhere, and then all of a sudden your head is touching your head right above you? And that somehow your feet are above you? Felt that, I felt that way in the woods before. You felt that way in the woods? Yeah. So I'm bringing up all these really strange stories to tie them all together. Dons and Rabja would have these three levels of plays to understand the three realms. And how does that relate to Hellier? Well, I'm about to put it all together. Interacting with the three realms is just like that. As we walk on Earth, you know, we stand on the ground and we just walk. When a part of your spirit is in the underworld, well then, it's just like you're walking upside down. It's like your feet, or like your body is underneath your physical body, and you're walking underneath the ground. And when you're in the upper realms, it's like your head is touching your head, but your feet is in the sky. I think it can also happen if you're just, if you're walking in a familiar place, and all of a sudden it seems unfamiliar or you get disoriented, sometimes that can be an aspect of it too. Right. And that's, so th these are the three levels, you know, heaven, earth, and the underworld that are just everywhere. It's happening all the time. Everything you do is directly related to some kind of effect in other realms. Now, why is that important to Hellier and Somerset? It's because of this unique geomagnetic energy of Somerset. Somerset has the largest quartz crystal deposit, I think in North America, possibly the world, right? It also has the energy of space, which also is the energy of heaven coming down and touching right in downtown Somerset. Yeah, like heck you normally. Exactly. It also has a massive cave system. A massive underworld system. So I'm drawing this really huge map to draw it all to this. The three realms that all human beings exist in are exceedingly pronounced, exceedingly clear, exceedingly strong like I've never experienced anywhere else and very close and very close here in Somerset so if you want to walk in all three realms and understand it come have a stay in Somerset and that is really the secret of what is going on here in Somerset Amy she's a madman she's the t atypical madman what was she seeing? She was seeing the Hell Realm. Much like if you go to Shambhala and you do training, you can see a Heavenly Realm. Amy clearly was on drugs, but she also, like a lot of people here in Somerset, was touched by another realm. And she saw into it. And she filled in with her mind what she couldn't understand psychically. Do I think that there... Like, I mean, there are so many holes in her story that if it wasn't for the fact that she she said some things to the to the to um, to Greg and Dana and all those guys that she couldn't have known, they never would have come here. As she was doing whatever she was doing, she psychically heard something. She psychically saw something. You know? 
people enough people have gone to those locations where she said those things happen there were no body parts but maybe in another realm there definitely was if you try if somebody comes to somerset and they travel all around some between somerset proper and daniel boone you'll see this bliss realm and as soon as you go down the road that amy lived in it it definitely gets dark real quick if you don't have a suv your car is not making it out of there the mystery about somerset is actually a mystery it's a mystery that actually extends all over the world now here is one of the magnetic maps that i got off of, of nasa Yeah, okay, so here in the United States, right here, we see the sh we see six strong magnetic centers. Okay, this one right here is Hellier. This is in South. This one all the way to the left is South Dakota. This one on the lower left, that's Sedona. This one right here is well it's um that's texas right there but right here new orleans is right? new orleans and right here is miami and we'll get into what this one is now the reason i i revealed the secret of the sphinx was actually to to once again have credentials about what i'm going to say because i'm going to say some things right now that you're just going to have to i can't reveal why i know this shit all right <clears throat> you don't have to so we on the upper left hand corner in america in in north america the united states this red part right here that's south dakota now if you go look on the map or on the website where this comes from it points out that the areas in red have very ex expansive type of magnetics the areas in blue are very inclusive drawing in secluded now what's interesting about the upper left head upper left hand area in South Dakota, it's kind of a sister city to Somerset. In South Dakota, that area, I don't know if the Van Allen belt touches down, but it also has caves. And it also has large crystal deposits. But it's very expressive and expansive energy. It would put thing it would pull things away from it. Somerset also has caves. Also has, um, oh, it does have the Van Allen belt coming down. And it has a large crystal deposit. And from what NASA has said about the magnetics of this area, it draws in. It's inclusive. It doesn't, it, it keeps within itself. It doesn't bring people to it. Now, in the lower left hand corner, That's Sedona, Arizona, which is, <laughs> without a doubt, it, it's kind of like meeting a very beautiful person who does yoga all the time, who's living on a trust fund, um, can eat the very best food, wakes up when they want to, has no responsibilities, and just goes around giving everyone hugs. <laughs> Sounds like your typical hippie. Yeah, right, but I mean, like, just... You know, a trust fund baby, trust fund hippie. A, yeah. trust fund, a trust fund hippie who has no responsibilities and is just lighthearted and, you know. Hashtag van life. Never really gets into, like, anything serious, doesn't do any hard drugs, just chants and sings. And it's just very la la la. They don't have, um, they don't have caves there. They don't have crystals. They do have strong magnetics. I don't know if the Van Allen belt touches down. So... The only place I know that the Van Allen belt touches down is Somerset. So that's the only place I know where heaven, earth, and the lower realms actually interact. I don't, I don't know how to find out where the Van Allen belt touches down. Now the bottom red, the most interesting place about that, that is most like Somerset, is the fact that New Orleans is below sea level. So it also has strong earth energy 
and strong underworld energy. And if you know, like everybody knows that the dark forces in New Orleans are having a lot of fun. <laughs> Look at the, it's a red magnetic energy. It's expansive. It's expressive. You know? Very. And if anything, you know, people look into New Orleans, you can tell that there's a lot of underworld activity there that yeah. comes to the surface a lot. Mm-hmm. It's just accepted there. Yeah. It's part of the culture. It's it's also neat. I think it's very <laughs> neat. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. And there is, I wish, okay, so this is where, this is why I established my credentials with the Sphinx earlier. I really wish I could tell everybody what is there. There is something so paranormally, supernaturally, archaeologically unbelievable there. New Orleans? Yeah. The thing. <laughs> and I'm, I just, I can't reveal what it is, but it would definitely... I'm, I'm actually going to be looking into whether or not that same thing is here in Somerset in the future. But it definitely is quite the thing um and you know, everyone will just have to trust me well, maybe one day i'll be able to bring it out now the other reason i established my credentials is for the blue area down at the bottom of florida and the red area next to it now the blue area is actually where a coral castle is it's also the corner of the Bermuda Triangle. The red area is the upper corner of the Bermuda Triangle. A lot of people... Um, so, I'm going to say one thing that I learned through all my teachings. and um, Which is really going to make an interesting draw with all of these magnetic spots. The blue area is where Atlantis really is. That's where it really is. That's where the Bimini Road is. There is a there really is a pyramid underwater there. And what makes that interesting is that Somerset is part of these six powerful magnetic centers in North America. Something is going on here in Somerset that at one time people or, or, or there's this thing in, in New Orleans. And then, at one time, the magnetics down in, at the, the tip of Florida were strong enough to build a whole civilization on. So that draws some really interesting conclusions as to what is happening in Somerset. You know, um, we've come in this trip, you know, on our first trip here, we came here just to do really peaceful things, not really explore the, the, the dark side and... You know, it's clearly there. It's clearly there it's powerfully, but we just... We wanted to come and, you know, geek out paranormally, see all the hellier sights, <laughs> see, you know, meet you, try to meet, uh, you know, Kyle and Nate. And, you know, we didn't even get to, like, I feel like one-tenth of everything there is here to do. Um, it's an incredibly vibrant town where you could just... You could spend like a couple months even just discovering what is here. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. Not even to mention all the parks and natural wonders that are here. You 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 didn't even see hardly any of the natural wonders. I know. Right. Next time, yeah, we, we'll go out to the woods. We'll have and to stay. have a little more time. Yeah. I know. <laughs> I mean, I I I just I I feel like I've just been saying wow 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 <laughs> every day I've been here. I'm glad. Yeah, it's an incredible place. I can't wait to come back. Now, there's some interesting things about the area. Or, there's some interesting things about this area of the United States. And especially in the Ohio, like the this area of the of the United States, has a very dark history. The Ohio River Valley? The Ohio the River Valley. <laughs> So between um, the mountains in Cahokia, and, or is it, which one is, uh, what's that mounds all the way, what's, what's the mounds west of here, the uh, big one, is it Cahokia? Shoot, I don't know, that'd be a question for Dan Dutton. Right, so it's the, between, I had all, you know, 
I was when I was researching all this stuff. I had all it all in my mind, and now I've been. I wrote it all down, and was waiting to tell you. And some of the facts have gotten a little fuzzy. <laughs> <laughs> but in the Ohio River Valley, um, I was watching this documentary a couple months ago, and it pointed out that there was the Quetzalcoatl cult had worked its way up here, and was doing human sacrifice all throughout this area for a couple hundred years until just before the Spanish got here, which, you know, basically smallpox. So they were Mayan. Well, I don't know what they were, just the the actual practice of human sacrifice to the, to the being Quetzalcoatl, who, you know, demanded blood and all that stuff. Yeah. Thank, thank God for Quetzalcoatl because we live now in the fifth sun because of the people that did his oath. <laughs> well, we'll talk about that off, <laughs> off camera. <laughs> We're not going to talk about that. Um, but there was a lot of human sacrifice going on in this area. Well, I mean, to the east of here and to the west of here, there was human sacrifice going on. And the reason I, I bring that up is because through the practices that I do and, and, and the teachers that I learn from, it negative actions especially things like you know you basically had a really strong prac or like initiation into what negative actions can do for a whole area this weekend mm -hmm. um josh and i had some very interesting adventures and you know we discovered some cool things about somerset and uh you know just helping out the n undoing the negative energy here but just something that was done um without thought it was just careless action that led to yes a great negative right right well when there was human sacrifice energetically and spiritually it leaves a stain in an area so it was happening east and west of somerset and it may happen may have happened here but it happened for hundreds of years and that stain if you if you are aware psychically if you can see it it looks like floating blood everywhere so all around this area there would be great amounts of still to this day floating blood psychic stain so is there an underworld energy there's always been an underworld energy ever since the europeans got here and maybe that's a balance some people like to say that um now, I know there's been a lot of talk about Somerset having a lot of, you know, dark cults and all that. And I really want to, gosh, not focus on that. You know, if there's some, I mean, anywhere you go, if something good pops up, the, the opposite always pops up. Um, <laughs> Ms. Kang and I yeah. recently found out about the superheroes. Oh, yeah, that, that people are being real-life superheroes now. And um, anywhere that someone decides to be a superhero in that city, someone will shortly thereafter decide they're going to be a supervillain. Mm. Right. So that just seems to happen everywhere. It's just, it's just a natural way of doing things. Um, huh. So, you know... There's a lot of good in Somerset. And <laughs> I, the one thing about the Penny Royal crew and the Hellier crew is they're focused in one direction. The secret of Somerset and the secret of Hellier is not this underworld story. And they're being constantly drawn in this one direction that's just drawing them deeper and deeper and deeper. And at some point, you just have to think, how much of that is actually their own doing? Right, a feedback I, loop. I bring up the, the fact that there's, you know, human sacrifice going on far back as 12th century to point out that if you look in the darkness, you will continually find it. It will never end but if you look into the light 
Which, I mean, here in Somerset, there are a lot of people, tremendous amount of people, trying to bring people into the light. It's it, the real paranormal mystery of Somerset is that the three realms are here in unbelievable amounts. And if you look into the darkness, you will find it. The real part, the real mystery is all of it. I bet if you went to any of these religious institutions here in Somerset and asked if they had, or they believed they had a stronger, tangible interaction with their divine being than any other place in the earth, it would alarm, alarm the Hellier crew. It would alarm the Penny Royal crew. The, the magic and mystery of Somerset is that the divine reality here is amazing. But what other people don't seem to pick up on is, and, and from the few days I've been here, I know this is true. The earthly, the terrestrial reality of Somerset is like something I've never seen anywhere, anywhere else on earth. And you've traveled a lot. I, well, I mean, I wouldn't say I've traveled more than others, but I've traveled quite a bit. I've been to many, many places. And the family life here is through the roof. When it's good, it's, I'm, you know, you see families walking in the streets, and there's like a family closeness that's just everywhere. And people seem to be really supportive of everyone. There's a, there's a friendliness and a kindness and an acceptance that I haven't seen in too many places. And the human life here is supernaturally amazing. And it, that's to be explored as much as goblins or, or who owned the Mount Victory Mine or just, you know, what's happening in the dark recesses of, you know, a few caves here. Even the animal and plant life is incredibly vibrant here. Exactly, exactly. I mean, there I've, ne I've never seen such, you know, the minute animals that you don't see in too many places. Tree frogs. Um, All those birds. So many different kinds of birds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you go into the forest and it, it's like a, it's kind of a natural concert. You, you will hear so many different types of animals. You know, in, in the few days I went camping, I've talked with some of the people there. Everybody knows where the bears are. <laughs> Everybody's had, you know, and everybody kind of feels like they want to protect them. There's so much wildlife here. The, the fur on the animal seems to be thicker than I've ever seen anywhere else. You know, we, we saw a wreck or we saw a groundhog and I'd never seen fur that thick. Um, everything I've seen here on the colors of the animals, it, they're deeper. They're, they're more vibrant. Um, You know, and as far as the in industry in Somerset, there's only like 11,000 people who live in the town of Somerset. Or is, was it, is it 11,000 in the town? It's like, yeah, 11,000 in town and near 65,000 in the county. Right, 65,000 in the county. But Somerset seems to have all the businesses. Yeah. Everybody comes Somerset to Somerset to do business. Yeah. So human life here is... And and like so, like I said over the weekend, you know, so many older elderly people from like Ohio and other areas they retire here right I believe that yeah I noticed that there's a lot of um, people offering professional services um, selling furniture car dealerships yeah. realty just stuff that you don't even need all the time and there's so much of it for a relatively small population there is uh, just just you know just the like the tourism mm -hmm. yeah like i would have to say at least close to 50 percent of the tourism each year is just elderly people you know they come down here they I don't know. It's like when elderly people young. go on vacation or look for a place to retire, they want something that's nice and happy and peaceful. They are not necessarily looking for an adventure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's <laughs> plenty of communities just around Somerset and you know in Pulaski County that are just like the whole com the whole neighborhood is elderly people. It, but it, mm -hmm. 
and it's uh but it's got its fair share of darkness too you know yeah i'm sure yeah just like uh like missing people cases and stuff and and murder and all kinds of stuff like it's it's just as much as you know oh we're gonna go retire in somerset because it's one of the most lovely places we've ever been and we just love uh-huh. the lake and the town and there's so there's so many different churches to choose from like but at the same time you got you know 21 year old kids being shot in the head and rolled off into the lake you know every month <laughs> wow yeah yeah we we uh we have some theories about what's going on with the lake that we didn't even we don't even have time to share, you know. But from what you told us, <laughs> you know, and from what you've seen of us, you know, we we, we have a few things. Um, you know, <clears throat> Amy saw into the lower realms, and she couldn't fill in what like she was seeing something. She just didn't know what she was seeing, so. She filled in from her own reference points everything, which is what mad people do when they have a supernatural experience. That's kind of probably what most people do. Right. And, you know, and a lot of people are uh, now coming around to the fact that they're supposedly this, like, invisible being that's stalking the forest. And, you know, there's uh, photos of it in the Missing 411 movie and then... Um, People are talking about seeing like this predator type creature in the forest. And one thing I wanted to share with your viewers is that the people who taught me what I know and all of things that I do said that when some when the mind when someone sees something that they can't accept is real, when the mind can't accept it they interpret what they're seeing as a shimmer. They fill in the blanks with nothing, with empty space. Very much like the the Predator uh, invisibility cloak Mm -hmm. in the movie. That's a natural reaction to people not being able to make the leap from everyday reality that all humans agree on to actually witnessing, say, like, I don't know, Bigfoot. <laughs> 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 That's exactly what will happen to people, for the most part. Um, a lot of things have to happen for someone to see it, see something that they believe is impossible as a physical reality. There's a lot of things that go into it that don't normally occur. I can vouch for that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, that's right, you told me you... see. When I said that there are three types of uh, people who see the paranormal or see the, the, the greater reality, I said there's the child, the madman, and the mystic. And you said in one of your podcasts as a child that you saw goblin-type creatures. Yeah, outside my house. Every when time. you were a child. Yeah. Yeah, and you seem like an open guy now. And I'm pretty sure as a child you were very open. Yeah, definitely. See, I think you were just seeing the realm right next door. Yeah, I... Uh, uh, now that I've talked to you, you know, and we, I've thought about it, and in my head played it over, it's 100% possible that I was just seeing through the veil, you know, at the right time, because my, my physical and mental space were in such a weird place that it was just the perfect amount of chemistry to let me see through. Yeah, and you said that they noticed that um, you could see them, and they all came to look at you. Yeah, they looked at me. You right. know, they, wanted, uh, they either wanted to eat me or wanted to play. <laughs> I was scared for either. <laughs> um, <laughs> but that's the point: is that you were one of the three archetypes of people who see uh, the greater reality, and that is being a child. You were open. You were open-hearted. You didn't have any preconceptions. You just saw something as it really was. That seems to be, you know, the three types of of people, or three types of archetypes, seems to really be at play in the hellier story. You know, you have these innocents, you have these madmen, and then there seems to be a few mystics, and who knows what they're doing in this story. (laughs) (laughs) Now, I wanted to talk about the nature of dark coercion and 
more specifically get to the point which I think is the worst idea I have ever heard of in this whole Somerset hell your story is you guys bringing that pyramid to Mount Victory. It was all Nathan's plan. I'm sure. I don't know <laughs> whose idea. Or you say it's Nathan. Uh, I I'm gonna lay out a case as to why you guys should go there and burn it down. Mm. We took. We didn't leave it. You didn't leave it. No, it's above Jarfla. Oh, oh God, that's worse. <laughs> that is so much worse. That is. Oh man. It was a, right above your heads, actually, while you were drinking beer. That did seem like a strange place. Um, that is the worst thing that could. They would have. I kind of even would have been better if they left it. <laughs> 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 for the town of Somerset. All right, I'm going to lay out a case as to why you guys should burn that thing. Okay. Very well. Everyone, you know, it's all about the nature of what do dark forces do to make people behave as they want. You know, archetypically, they always think that there's some, like, being on someone's shoulder telling them to go against their conscience. That That's not how dark forces operate. <laughs> not at all. Um, what they actually do is they speak to you in your own voice and they make you think that something is a really good idea to do so you're hearing yourself speak and you're coming up with an idea that you're probably going to have a lot of enthusiasm to do it's going to seem like a great idea you're going to have a lot of momentum to do it and you just probably can't wait. You're gonna be filled with enthusiasm. It's not gonna, and it's not. It's gonna feel like you're the the best voice in your head. If you want to fight the dark forces, well then that's, <laughs> you know. Well, not everything that comes into your head and you think it's a great idea is gonna be <laughs> a force of darkness. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. But you know, you're gonna catch more flies with honey. That's that's a good saying. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. so what does a pyramid do all right it takes all the energy from the base and raises it up to the highest level of that of the pinnacle of the pyramid and then transmits the energy from the pinnacle so the whole energy of the base, or whatever it's on top of, can raise its energy to the pinnacle of the pyramid and then be broadcast out. What you guys actually did is you took a pyramid with mirrors, which means it's really, really going to broadcast, tuned it to the Mount Victory Mine, Brought it back to town. And now it's, it's... You've raised the power of the Mount Victory Mine to the pinnacle of that pyramid. To, you tuned that pyramid to the Mount Victory energy. And you put it in the center of town. Burn that <laughs> pyramid. <laughs> Does that sound like a good... Like, would you take your child's toy to, to the Mount Victory Mine... Let it hang out there for a little bit and then bring it back? Probably not. They're All right. You wouldn't do it for your child. Energy. <laughs> but you're going to make this powerful energy shape that's got mirrors that are realms. Like, if you if you uh, curse a mirror, it's opening to another realm. You basically opened the Mount Victory Mine in the center of town. No matter what you believe happening there, it's, it's, it's a mine that, that raped the earth. So it's not going to have good energy. You know, everyone talks about this idea that uh, you see all these people with um, robes, you know, going through the uh, forest and doing strange rituals. The Penny Royal cast went to Mount Victory Mine in, in robes. Yeah, we, we dressed in robes. You dressed in robes and did strange freaking rituals. There's that robe right there. <laughs> what makes you think that that was your idea? It wasn't my idea. No, I mean, whoever came up with the idea. Oh, I have no idea. What if the being there makes people think it's a good idea habitually? 
Okay, so my look on it is Nathan lived on a street, right, at the time that was very subject to paranormal energy and him and his wife had witnessed things on that street and he was also working you know right there downtown on the project and he was like i'm gonna film this trailer and we're gonna be wearing robes he's like we're gonna take the pyramid down there and we're gonna leave it there you know and we're gonna put a radio signal on it that way people can tune in and listen and like track it down and that was the initial idea Mm -hmm. and You know, it is possible that, you know, the mind was, you know, telling him to do all those things because it was the right opportunity for the mind to get into his head. So, every major, every every natural area has a being that overlooks it. Mount Victory Mine, probably, I haven't been there, I don't want to go there. But I know for a fact it's it's a strong, powerful spot in the area. In an already strong and powerful sp- place. And you, when you guys were going out there, you got stuck in the mud. And, um, you know, a lot of people, you know, I mean, I'm not breaking any, I'm not, I'm not saying anything rude by saying that every most of the people there were on some kind of altering substance. I mean, they've already publicly admitted that. And you never saw what happened. And, you know, I talked with some of the locals who went there already, and no one's really sure who was sober. And along came this man selling snakes. A man in the middle of the dark walked up to seven or eight people in robes. He felt very comfortable walking up to people in the middle of the woods and said, Do you want to buy my snakes? <laughs> I do you like do you want to buy my snakes? I normally sell them to churches for snake dancing. So let me get this straight. First off, how do you know that man was human at all? In many, many cultures throughout the world, in most cultures, when you go to a, like a mountain or a cave or a power spot, it is traditional to leave some kind of offering. So that the being of the of the area doesn't harm you. You guys were going, in your own minds, to a hell mouth. You know, that was supposedly used by dark cults. Mm-hmm. You know, in Hell Your Mystery, you know, they had their, their synchronicities. <laughs> One of them was a tin cup. You guys are tripping balls. Well, not you. But you're going out to do this ritual to put a power object on top of a hell mouth. And a being comes along and sells you, is trying to sell you snakes. And he's telling you, I do this. I, I collect these snakes to sell them to the churches that do snake dancing. Snakes. Evil loves snakes. You guys missed your tin cup moment. <laughs> you missed it. That's, that's what, the clue. That's what Dan said. Dan, Dan said. Uh, any, he told Nathan. He said, anytime an artistic opportunity comes across to you like that again, and you don't take it, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> so, snake dancing. There are a lot of. There's a lot of things to chase down there. You know, a lot of a lot of cultures dance with snakes for positive reasons a lot of uh, cultures use snakes for dark reasons you know do you know about any snake dancing churches in the area uh my stepmom when she was younger went to one with her friend in the area but i've never been so there's something there there may be a snake dancing church still in the area there's okay. definitely those types of churches, those whispering churches around, but mm-hmm. I've never been to one. Okay. Well, I say, you know, as, as um, the these ancient cultures uh, would leave offerings to beings of a certain area, there's probably a big-ass snake in that area who's like the archetypical energy of that area. 
I don't really believe you guys saw someone human. I think that was the energy of the area interacting with you in a way that you could understand. You brought, you know, you brought a freaking pyramid to its temp to its temple right. to its area. It would have been grateful, and it was probably offering you what was something of value to it. You know, mm-hmm. so it sent a good old boy in a truck <laughs> full of snakes offering you. <laughs> That in its house. Been here three probably. days and you don't right. know the terminology. No, but I mean <laughs> Which really gets into a good old boy with his snakes. <laughs> hey, man, He's a snake you. dancer. <laughs> Would you like to touch his snake? <laughs> <laughs> um God, you know, I mean uh, there's some stuff I'm just going to leave out. I just don't want to put out in the public. Um, but uh, I really think you guys should burn that pyramid. Because no matter what, it's been tuned to a certain energy vibe. And you built it to do that. And now you put it right in the center of town. You know, nobody was in like a really solid mind state. It was a stressful time. You were stuck in the mud. I was lot, good. Yeah, you were good. Well, you've been in the military, so. <laughs> <you know. laughs> but I also didn't see the snake handler. You also didn't see truck. it. Yeah. That in itself is a really interesting point in favor of that maybe not being an ordinary person. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. It's weird to me. i never seen the truck, the headlights, never seen the man, never heard anybody talking to anybody. And then all of a sudden, like I told you, and know, you were the only one that was firmly in your own mind on Earth. Right, I was. You're the only out, sober one. Yeah. I was looking out for everybody else's well-being, you know, because mm-hmm. I knew there was copperheads right. and rattlesnakes, and knew that there's danger always when you take a big group of people into an unknown area. Were you thinking area. about snakes when you were thinking about the dangers? I'm just curious. There. No. Okay. No. No, I just knew, you know, if I smelled. You know, yeah, yeah. Copperheads or herd rattlesnakes, but there's also places like around that time, like, like if you see like logs and stuff fell over and a bunch of brush and leaves up on it, like that's where they like to nest at, or okay. or holes in the ground at the at the base of trees, you know. Like there's there's certain types of places and stuff that I'll make people avoid when I take them to the woods, mm-hmm. just like when I see a briar patch or a patch of poison yeah. ivy or you know poison oak vines just tell people you know hey don't go near there i guess the point was that you knew everybody was tripping and you wanted to make sure that i had no idea anybody was tripping oh you didn't know (laughs) Nope, i was just doing my job as their guy so you just all right yep (laughs) so moving forward you know look at um snake dancers the use of snakes in all different traditions good and bad um the idea that you were coerced to go do something which in my mind was really bad it was a really bad idea sounds good hey let's all take you know psychedelic drugs get in robes and bring a pyramid to a hell mouth and at any rate it was fun oh i'm sure it was fun yeah you know but you know then this it sounds like fun and then if you don't believe it's a real thing then why not yeah why not yeah but the dark forces believe in you yeah <laughs> <laughs> even if you don't believe in them I mean, that much innuendo about a mind being negative is enough to turn it negative. You guys went there because you believed it to be dark. You brought an antenna power amplifying pyramid there, tuned it to the energy, placed it now in the center of town, which, wow. That's such a bad idea. Um, And then, out of the middle of the night, comes a man selling you the the living reality of the living symbol of evil. The snake. I mean, in some cultures. In most, I would believe. Well, I mean, Native Americans have a lot of positive uses of the snake, and I don't, you know, positive there's, and negative. Yeah. 
But oh, in well, American society, I would think that most people would have a more negative view of snakes. Right, because most Americans are Christian, and the serpent is a bad That's thing. That's true, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it was that being... Especially was, in this town. Yeah. Definitely in the South. Definitely in this town. <laughs> definitely in the South. Yeah, definitely in the South. Um, no, I don't think that snakes are, and especially snake energy, is particularly... Snakes are just snakes. Snakes are just snakes. Snaky snakes. Yeah. I, have and, a, I have a skin in my gun case. I mean, I love it, you know? Yeah. I don't necessarily like snakes, but I think they taste good, and I'm not scared <laughs> of them. So, yeah, I mean, that was the biggest ball drop in all the Hellier and, Sun, and Penny Royal. Like, it's funny because s- Dan said the same thing. He's like, "That was it. That was your opportunity of gold." <laughs> yeah. And other people have told him, you know, you should have interviewed him. You know, should have had him in. Should have had him on. But could he have ever left the forest? <laughs> you know, what? we don't know. Yeah, you get bit by one of those snakes. Who knows what you are the next day, man? Right. <laughs> <laughs> you wake up uh, a successful corporate possessed. CEO running the Amazon. I don't know. <laughs> Jim Bezos. <laughs> I don't know anything about him, but um, you know. Okay, so did I say you guys should burn that pyramid yet? Yeah, yeah, one. yeah, yeah, yeah. Get an old priest and a, a young priest, and then <laughs> freaking, you know, bless the f- popsicle out of that. <laughs> that needs to be. That needs to not be. Yeah. Break the mirrors. Well, yeah, break the mirrors. That's like seven years of bad luck, isn't it? <laughs> well, keeping them up is a lifetime of bad luck. Well, uh, I'll, they'll be hearing this, so... Yeah, I mean, it's been tuned to a lower realm, buddy. I mean, that it's not FM, it's not AM. Um, you could probably bury them somewhere. Whatever. Well, burning would probably ruin the mirrors. Get them blessed. Okay. I mean, get every damn priest in this town. Well, not every damn priest. Every priest. <laughs> every priest, every nun, every one of them. Just, like, beat it with Bibles till it just disintegrates. I mean, anything you can do. You know what I'm saying? So, in Hellier and the Penny Rail podcast, the topic of satyrs come up. Now, um, that's an interesting... So in my world, satyrs are real. They actually do exist. I have been taught how to interact with them. I've never done it. Because I don't want to be in the forest with a seven foot being that likes to have sex with everything at night. But, you know, I'm also just not in, you know, in, in the things that I've learned, I've learned how to do it. Now, if Dan had showed up, Dan Dutton, I would have told him a little bit more than I've ever told anybody how to do it. But that'll be for another day. But what I did want to say about satyrs, and it's interesting that the Hellier crew invoked Pan, and that it's interesting that the Penny Royal crew is putting a play about satyrs, is much like there are beings that inhabit, say, a mountain or whatever, and take care of it. Satyrs are responsible for the tone, the quality of energy that flows through large areas of earth. It can be mountain, it can be streams, but it's vast areas of earth. And the fact is, is that satyrs, for the people who know how to work with satyrs, um, and they're few and far between in the world now, you know, Um, there's very few people in the world who know how to interact with satyrs but um, if you can work with a satyr you can help uh, the earth energy of an area uh, be raised, be cleansed or be cursed you know that's a bad you know it's neutral Um, I will say that the Hellier crew only got one aspect of it right and they did it so poorly you know at least they were on the right track at least they were trying but it's interesting because i told you about quetzalcoatl and the human sacrifice in the area and you know our own interactions this this last few days has all been 
has been all about cleaning up the area, you know. Here are two groups, Hellier and Penny Royal, who are spontaneously doing something involving satyrs. Well, first off, I wanted to talk about Penn. Um, through, a large, through a strange series of coincidences, I know where Penn lives. Um, and this picture I have up right now is of the master musicians of Jujuka. They're out of Morocco. They're actually the oldest rock band in the history of the world. They've been around for 4,000 years. They are the band that originally was... Um, they were commissioned by the Greek nation to come every year to the Bacchanals from Morocco. Why? You see this, you see this picture right here? They're in a cave outside their, uh, their, their town in Morocco. That cave is where Pan lives. He lives there. That's so weird that they're called the Master Musicians because we have a Master's Musicians Festival here every year. Yeah? Huh? Yes. You know, Pan's actual home on Earth is in uh, Morocco. Hmm. This band has been around for 4,000 years taking care of Pan. They know more about him than anybody. I had a friend who went out there uh, and stayed with them in 2005. He was in that cave, and he definitely felt horny. Like, everything you would ever think, you know, happy, innocent, full of light, goodness. Uh, he spent a couple days drumming with these people. He said that they were all, like, the men there were all tricksters, and the women were all just all over guys. But they were like family; like they were friendly. It wasn't. It didn't have any sense of shame about it. Hmm. And I just find it interesting that people are trying to invoke this sadder like energy here because there has been human sacrifices. There is a dark side, and it really wouldn't. I mean, at least archetypically, it wouldn't be bad to try to do as much as you can to help out the earth here especially with like what's going what you told me about the cumberland river and all that stuff i mean there's so much good yeah. here and like the pollution is just tearing it all down and the for anybody that doesn't know the energy of satyrs is fertility and plenty harvest they're really all about um bringing in a lot of good things and having a, a very good quality of life. So, you know, one day I'll talk to Dan and I'll, I'll give him, I'll give him, like he seems somebody who is genuinely interested, genuinely interested in trying to understand it. And I'll tell him some of the secrets that, uh, I can't tell him everything because I don't agree what it takes to interact with Satter's, um, I, I just don't, like, my morals don't run that way. I won't do it. Um, but it, it's it's from the morality of another time of, of human of human existence. It mm -hmm. might still work some places in the world. It might still exist in somewhere in the world, yeah, but it doesn't work for me. If it's ever been a thing, it's always going to exist someplace else in the yeah, world. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I'm, I'm, but it's, it's not going to exist in my world. Um, and so... I, I'm coming down to the last few topics, and uh, the last topic I definitely want to miss Kang here for to talk about. All right, so there's two there's two uh, things I want to talk about, and then we got to take off. But um, in ancient times, the Bacchanals, those you know what we think of now as orgy rites, were not orgy rites. They were a way of basically dancing yourself into an ecstatic union with whatever deity you were worshiping at the time and having a brief few moments of of existence beyond the state of good and evil actually just being and then involved with an actual ritual that would change yourself and benefit the area of the land you know uh there was a lot more training that went into in the early days before it just became a sex party. <laughs> there was a lot more things that went into um, being a part of a Bacchanal than just showing up, getting drunk, and having sex. It took years. 
it took years. Um, it was a, it was a form of sacred dance and, uh, the training to do that, uh, doesn't exist in too many places. And I don't know anybody who knows the information who's actually doing it. It's like I said, it's, it's from a different time when the world was different and it wasn't just, uh, something base and gross. It was something that people did with actual awe and reverence, you know, in one of the cultures, um, and just imagine this happening today, they would have, um, I forget which God it was, but it was like, it was a goat God, but it wasn't Pan. And there was a letter from a 13 year old girl the day she was going to be initiated into this God that was so full of reverence, devotion. And what she would have to do is this statue of this God had a male penis and this young girl would mount it and have her first sexual initiation with the statue. And the statue had been tuned to the God. And the letter from this young girl was as devout as you'd ever hear from any faith ever. I mean, she, she wasn't in it for herself. She was trying to become worthy and humble before this being. So the culture in which the Bacchanals happened had that kind of society around it, you know, and that just does, that's the world is, that world is gone. So did the Greeks ruin that? You know, I mean, ayahuasca has been ruined because there's a lot that goes into that to use it properly. It's really difficult for, I, in order for any kind of a ritual like that, to um, remain completely sacred, it's it's very difficult. Um, you have to make sure that nobody nobody else ever even finds out about it because they'll corrupt it. It's got to be kept completely secret to just the sacred order. Exactly. And I mean, now I just the other week I got a Facebook ad to go down to South America and exist in this very exotic hotel to go do ayahuasca. And all these people who couldn't even afford to stay in that hotel are the shamans, you know, and they're going to give me like food that they can't even afford to eat. I have some, <laughs> <laughs> but it's for me, myself in the woods. Right. Well, have you done it? Not really what we were asking, but... Dude, don't, don't. <laughs> I'll talk to you off camera. What really, like, it's, it's... I, I, you know, I will never do it because I've, anybody who ever takes it is so permanently changed that I also think the plant is deciding people's minds for them. And the training I've actually... What it actually takes for someone to actually have a the real meaning of the ayahuasca it's years of training before you even take it much like the tantric process of purification identification with something divine and then reality experiencing reality with the divine that's step three taking ayahuasca is step three and you're surrounded by a bunch of people who've already passed through step three now you now anybody with a little bit of money can order it on amazon and be tripping balls at a seven up you know I, I always take my psychedelic type drugs in a more spiritual manner than people who just want to pay money to, you know, be psycho nuts. Because to yeah. me, it's more just like doing shrooms. It's like that's way more sacred than just oh man, look at that over there. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. like it's such a healing and and knowledgeable teacher that it should be respected in that manner too. I mean, it's, it's definitely, uh, I, I think something as powerful as ayahuasca, you would want to, um, have some kind of guidance with it, even if you're taking that perspective. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you, you know, if you take it, you're going to be leaking from all of your orifices and not have any control of your body. 
And yeah. Yeah, like you could run through the woods for days and not know yeah, where you I, are. I just needed to know when you was coming back down the side. <laughs> <laughs> well, I charge money and you'll have to come to my resort and, you know, we'll play I'm pan fights for me. you and stuff like that. <laughs> but my point is that with the Bacchanals, there was such a deep reverence for it and it took years. You know, the, the Bacchanals were filled with women who had gone through that, men who had gone through similar things. It was a culture of deep reverence. And it the point of all of it was to help the land and make you better prepared for your wifely or husbandly duties. And, you know, also to increase um, the amount of women, children that women had because it was hard for a lot of women to get pregnant. So they figured if they had sex with eight men, it, it would... Uh, magically happened it was a fertility ritual where they would have sex with a number of different people and then you know some of the women that weren't able to conceive with their husband would suddenly become pregnant as from the magic of the ritual hmm. so i mean there's <laughs> so while. much to it but if you have a small gene pool that can help too yeah and and the idea that hellier the hellier crew and and and, and uh, the penny royal are in investigating this is that yeah, there is a there's a reason for it in in this area, but you know, the idea is to actually clean up Somerset spiritually, you know, from what's here. <laughs> the, <laughs> you know, the 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 the, the, uh, the partying part of the ritual, and you know that side of it definitely goes on here. I mean, a lot of the older gentlemen and ladies partake on that on the lake. You know, it's it's not hidden. They think it's hidden, but it it's not hidden. There is plenty of parties like that. Yeah, but I mean, that's there's a I mean, a sex party is not a ritual. It's just a sex party, right? You know, and you know, if everybody you know, it's all adults and they all want to be there. There's no reason not to have a sex party, I guess. Yeah, I suppose on a boat would be a good place. I mean, <laughs> oh, yeah. you can just stand there and let the waves do with all the work for you. You yeah. know, what I mean. <laughs> But, um, so the last point I want to bring up, and it's a hard point to bring up, and the only time I've ever actually done it successfully is with Miss Kang. We were having a conversation once, and it starts off like this. It's, it's about my brother. My brother is a scientist, um, a full-on, through-and-through scientist. He thinks like a scientist. He has all the rigorous screening of information through the scientific process. I have interacted with Bigfoot. I've interacted with Bigfoot a lot. Um, you've seen enough this week that I'm I'm no joke. I'm not, you know, I, I can do what I say I can do. I believe you. Yeah. You've seen enough this weekend. I have. You know. It was wonderful. I'm glad you were there. I've invited, I've talked to my brother about my interactions with Bigfoot. And there comes a point where, you know, my brother's a scientist. I guess I could say I'm a mystic. And between science and mysticism, there is this wall that the two can't meet, where the scientific process cannot understand the mystical realities yeah. or the supernatural mm -hmm. realities or the supernormal realities. And the supernatural realities have no way of being translated to the logical scientific mind. There is a dis that I'm trying to, to say that there is a wall that nobody has been able to connect. I, Not, I, I definitely believe you up till now, mm -hmm. but I also think that science is just a side effect of all those other things until we reach the point to where we can. But you are right till now. You're right. Your brother's right. You, and you're right. There is a wall. It can't be mm -hmm. breached. Yeah, and I think that touches on what you said in the very beginning, that maybe we need to think instead of supernatural, it's supernatural. It's really... Um, it's very natural. It's so natural that we're, we're thinking too complex to understand the rudimentary, you know, mathematics of how natural it is. Right. And there's a lot of stuff that science doesn't know. And 
as a scientist, someone is only willing to accept things that have already been proven, but they know that there's a lot of stuff out there that hasn't been proven yet. And, right. and that's why scientists have work to do. Otherwise they'd be done. Right. But you would, but to anybody that understands that there is more to it, that they just can't prove it. You're the next Nicholas Copernicus, you know, mm -hmm. you're, you're, you're an insane man that should right. be thrown in jail <laughs> and nobody should listen to you. you yeah. Know? That's, and but I, I think you're. And right. then after there, a while, people look at it and go, "Oh, hmm, maybe he was right." Yeah. <laughs> and and science always wants to have um, a series of of investigations and questions which come to that can that can repeat a process. Everything that I know is based on spiritual energy, which can't really ever be repeated the same way twice. But you've got methods that you follow and those methods work to a greater or lesser degree because, and the reason it's a greater or lesser degree is because the situations are different. Mm -hmm. And anytime you're working in a natural environment, the situation's never going to be exactly the same twice. You know, um, people take a lot of psychedelics uh, to have some sort of spiritual um, experience. One of my teachers said something really interesting. He said that can never be trusted because it is also a chemical process. So even that in itself, you know, it's a temporary understanding, but it can't be repeated because it's based on the food you ate, how your mm -hmm. metabolism is, uh, where the hormone level is in your body combined with your spiritual level. I totally agree with that. But at the same time, so many people don't understand how powerful the chemical concept of, you know, a trip is. Mm -hmm. That they're like, oh, I had a bad trip, you know. Like, no trip is bad. It's just a different technique to learning or understanding knowledge. The, the spiritual energy, spiritual understandings are alive. You know, it's a living process and uh, it, it changes from second to second everywhere. And it does seem to fall outside the ability to quantify it through the scientific process. And I, I, I wish someone could just create a language between science and um, mysticism. I know that there are books out there that you know beyond me in, in physics and, and, and paranormal that seem to make an understanding but um, this wall between science and, and paranormal is so strong that science doesn't even think paranormal exists and it also exists in people when people you know they see something they don't understand they, they fill it their mind fills in the blanks with self-reference or that shimmer mm-hmm it's a real block in our reality as we know it in our realm today in, in the earthly mindset and the earthly beliefs. And a lot of that block is put there intentionally. Um, every time a child says there's a monster in my room and their mom says, Oh honey, there's no monster. It's just a pile of clothes, you know, go back to bed. Monsters don't exist. Because children really do see spiritual entities and maybe there is something that looks like a monster to that kid and the mom says it doesn't exist. So then the kid said, well, you know, mom said that's just my eyes playing tricks on me. So it must be that because they trust their mom. You know, my, my teacher told me an interesting story recently. He was saying that um, the Aborigines of Australia were the most enlightened culture the earth has ever produced their dream skills were so were so advanced that they're lo they're lost to the world today like dream yogas and stuff they could dream while awake they were psychic all of them they didn't need communic they didn't need phones they could talk to everybody psychically they knew how to exist with the land without much toil or effort and out, uh, from what i can tell of australia it's not an easy place to live when and then we populated the whole country with criminals. 
when these people first started meeting the Aborigines, the Aborigines had no word for war. Because they said, why would you kill me? You'd be hurting yourself. That level of disconnect between the, the mindset of most of the world today and what the Aborigines of Australia were is, is, is part of this wall. We can't even talk to other people about it to stop killing. You know, so it's the same thing between the paranormal and science. It's this wall that needs to be brought down in some way. You know, if there's a real mystery paranormally or scientifically, it's this. It's bridging these parts of ourselves, the spiritual, with our earthly life. And that disconnect is greater than it's ever been on the planet. I mean, if there's a real poverty, if there's a real Armageddon or, or apocalypse, it's that the human beings do not engage one third of their entire life, truly the spiritual. And that, and to recognize the spiritual is also the earth, that we are also connected to the earth or we're also connected to these paranormal beings that are around us and they have an effect on us. And, you know, the hellier, the hellier story is great because it's the first time in my adult life that I felt like reading, like I did when I was a kid, when I was reading the Narnia Chronicles, yeah. you know, or the Lord of the Rings, you know, I'm, 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 and, and you know, I, I've said my piece about Hellier and, and, and Penny Royal, but it's been nothing but a, like, I, I feel, you know, this last couple of days exploring Somerset has been like, I stepped into a Narnia book. <laughs> 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 I want to use that as my new company that slogan. That Step into Narnia. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it I, does feel that way when you walk out in the woods. You're, it feels like another realm. Uh, I wish we could have went for a hike. I could have yeah. took you all so many places. Oh, we're coming. next time. Yeah, we're definitely coming back. This has been wonderful. So, uh, I very much thank you, and I look forward to having more adventures with yes, uh, sir. you and yes, Miss Kang and this Miss Kang. Yeah. And we have we have so much more stuff to do, you know. We have some plans for that for that for the cave out on Strawberry. Good. Yeah, we came up with some yeah. plans. Good. There's a, there's other cases too. Yeah. So if you're interested, just let me know. Yes. Yes, just, we definitely will. Jeremy was telling me about one last night. We we have to kayak down and let you all see that one as well. Oh, that sounds yeah. great. Yeah, yeah, the breathing cave. You have to see it. It's oh, beautiful. Yeah. Oh, right, the cave that breathes. Yeah, you yes. guys mentioned that. Yeah, that. That, that is amazing. Really cool. And it Short is. Creek, you know? Yeah, Short Creek's awesome. If you need a skinny dip, you know, that's going to, you know, cleanse your soul. <laughs> <laughs> a skinny dip that's going to cleanse your soul. <laughs> it is. So I'll get dirty the night before. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry. I am glad you all got to come down, and I'm glad we got to do this. This is just this is one of my favorite parts of it. It's been it's been a treat just hearing all the knowledge you had to share and i think that i hope everybody else that i share it with you know respects it in in the manner that that you do so and they burn that <laughs> gosh darn tw that gd twinkie pyramid burn it <laughs> yeah you could call it whatever you want it <laughs> all right man so talk to you later all right thank you all right bye-bye